I'd like to start this video with a moment of silence for Epicurus, specifically because of the way he's portrayed in the School of Athens work by Raphael. He just looks derpy here. Actually, you know who he looks like? Don't hate me for this, but... <laughs> So you walk into the giant market of philosophy, in search of a life philosophy for you. Now you tried stoicism, which is all the rage, but you're not 100% sold, you know? So you decide to try their competition, the Pepsi is stoicism's Coca-Cola, so to speak. You decide to see what Epicureanism is all about. Well, howdy folks, I'm Amy from Amygdala Vids, and in this video I hope to give you a little taste of Epicureanism. Just a little taste, I'm not a scholar or an academic, I'm just some idiot with a drawing pad and a mic. So I'm going to be focusing on the ethical side of Epicureanism, because, and I could be wrong on this, I'm assuming you're less interested in metaphysics. And yeah, I know, the two complement each other, but I'm guessing y'all just want the good stuff, the real meat and potatoes. So in this video, I'll be looking at four big ideas in Epicureanism that fit under this idea of the four-part cure. Let me quote the four-part cure first, then we'll go into greater depth. I'm reading off this The Epicurus Reader's Book, which states the four-part cure as Don't fear God, don't worry about death, what is good is easy to get, what is terrible is easy to endure. Now Epicurus expands upon this in his letter to Menoesius which is primarily what I'll be quoting. So let's jump into Don't Fear God. Here's Epicurus on not fearing God. Side note, it might be easier to just substitute happy for blessed. First, believe that God is an indestructible and blessed animal, in accordance with the general conception of God commonly held, and do not ascribe to God anything foreign to his indestructibility or repugnant to his blessedness. Believe of him everything which is able to preserve his blessedness and indestructibility. Unfortunately, Epicurus doesn't say much else about God in his letter, but this quote is sufficient to give us an interpretation of what he's saying. So we have God, or in some cases gods, and these gods are indestructible and happy. I mean, you're God, you pretty much got everything you want, right? You want that bloomin' onion from Outback Steakhouse? Got it. You want the new Xbox Series X with Cyberpunk included? Done. You want a Star Wars sequel that doesn't suck? Well, actually, even God couldn't make that happen. Point is, this God is infinite and happy, so why would he care about us again? Come on, is God gonna really piss his pants when he finds out that he didn't go to church on Sunday because you'd rather sleep in? You think God would care if I sacrificed a chicken to him or something? He probably doesn't give a damn. He's out there in an infinite state of bliss. Now, although that means, under this interpretation of God, we can't rely on him for any benefit bestowed upon us, this also means that we don't gotta worry about the big fella coming down and knocking us out for getting laid before marriage. He's out there chilling and unconcerned about us, so we shouldn't fear God. Next, Epicurus says not to fear death. Again, quoting from his letter to Menoesius, For that which while present causes no distress, causes unnecessary pain when merely anticipated. So death, the most frightening of bad things, is nothing to us, since when we exist, death is not yet present, and when death is present, then we do not exist. Therefore, it is relevant neither to the living nor to the dead, since it does not affect the former, and the latter do not exist. So you're here, watching this video, probably nibbling on some snacks like some goldfish, and you're alive. So I ask you, in what way does death affect you? Well, obviously I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna lose all this, and it's gonna be scary, and it's gonna probably be an infinite void of nothingness, and whoa, 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 slow down there, partner. All your concerns about death affecting you aren't present yet. Death will come when it will, and you won't be conscious to whine about it when it happens now, will you? So how does death affect you presently? Well, it's just giving you unnecessary emotional problems. And who needs that? Reminds me a little bit of the Wittgenstein quote, Death is not an event in life. We do not live to experience death. Just chill and don't fear death. Don't let it paralyze your life. This is in contrast with the Heidegger video I did on death, which you should also check out. So next, Epicurus talks about how what is good is easy to get. So this relates to Epicurus being a hedonist, but not the sex, drugs, and rock and roll hedonist, where you just consume as much pleasure as possible before you die. No, Epicurus is a hedonist in the sense that pleasure is the goal of life, 
But we gotta first find out what Epicurus means by pleasure. To quote from the same letter, when we say that pleasure is the goal, we do not mean the pleasures of the profligate, or the pleasures of consumption, as some believe, either from ignorance and disagreement, or from deliberate misinterpretation, but rather, the lack of pain in the body and disturbances in the soul. So Epicurus wants us to draw a distinction between pleasures. Cause look, when we say pleasure, we could be talking about a lot of things here. One person could be thinking about spending some time with friends, and another could be thinking about so there's two ideas of pleasure that we should be considering. First, pleasures that help us address and deal with some pain, be it a bodily pain or mental pain. And second, pleasures that do not specifically address a pain. Quoting Epicurus again, For we are in need of pleasure only when we are in pain, because of the absence of pleasure. And when we are not in pain, then we no longer need pleasure. So here's an example. I'm hungry, which is a pain, so I eat, which is a pleasure that alleviates the pain. This would be a good pleasure, for lack of a better word, to Epicurus, because it addresses the pain. Another example, I'm not hungry, but I see some cotton candy for sale and eat it up. This would not be a good pleasure to Epicurus because there's no pain being addressed. Taking this to the max, we don't get a life of conventional hedonism full of sex and good food, but rather, a pretty prudent life. Epicurus himself claimed he could compete with Zeus for happiness if all he had were barley cakes and water. I've never had barley cakes, so I can't 100% speak to their taste, but they sound pretty boring. Furthermore, he goes on to say, Prudence is the principle of all these things, and is the greatest good. So when we consider how little you need to be happy in the Epicurean view, then yeah, the good is easy to get. But what about pain? See, both the Stoics and Epicurean we're after this idea of ataraxia, which can roughly be translated into mental tranquility. In order to do that, you gotta get rid of mental turmoil. The Stoics got their own way of dealing with this, and hopefully the previous discussion shows an Epicurean strategy. But what is the Epicurean idea when it comes to pain? Unfortunately, I couldn't find much on pain in the letter to Menoesius. However, I did find a good quote from his Principal Doctrines number 4. Continuous pain does not last long in the body. On the contrary, pain, if extreme, is present a short time. And even that degree of pain, which barely outweighs pleasure in the body, does not last for many days together. Illnesses of long duration even permit of an excess of pleasure over pain in the body. So this is a weird quote. Some examples might help to interpret what Epicurus is saying. So back when I was a kid, I was running around the house, slipped, and hit my head against the edge of the stairs. I got rushed to the hospital, got some stitches in my head, received an ugly ass scar that hopefully hasn't messed with my love life yet, and then got a happy meal on the way home. It was painful, I cried like any other four year old would, but hey, it's over, I'm here now, and those McNuggets were pretty dope. Now obviously, this is just one example, and I don't know how others would hold up, like getting a limb cut off or some other graphic stuff. An example of long-term illness permitting the excess of pleasure over pain can probably be seen from the excuse to lay in bed. I mean, remember back in elementary school when you got a stomach ache or a fever and couldn't go to school as a result? Sure, it sucked, but, I mean, you got to sleep in, watch TV, eat at home, not deal with classes. I don't know, in mild cases, I would have been down to get sick and stay home rather than go to school at 6am. Well, that was a super dumbed down explanation of the four part cure for life from Epicureanism. Obviously, there's a lot more here in Epicureanism, not even touching metaphysics and epistemology, but only staying in ethics. I'd recommend checking it out. Epicurus has no big book like the Meditations of the Enchiridion, so I'd suggest getting some collection of minor writings, which includes the letter to Menoesius. Thanks for watching, friends. Do your pal Amy a solid and hit the subscribe button and the like button as well. Hit the bell to stay updated for more casual philosophy content, and I'll see y'all next time.